Hi, everybody, and thank you for your interest in the long-term facilities planning process going on here in the School District of Reedsburg. My name is Roger Rindo, and I'm honored to serve as the superintendent here in Reedsburg. Today, you're going to have the opportunity to learn about what the board's been working on for the last six months. And then, at the end, you'll be invited to join us next month, where we'll stop talking and we'll listen to you and get your feedback on some of the initial ideas that the board has put together at a very high level regarding that long-term plan. Today you'll have a chance to hear about our deferred maintenance needs. You'll have a chance to hear about our community growth and the growth in our school district and over time the impact of that growth on our building capacities. You'll also have a chance to learn about modern learning design and how new school designs and how they function can best support innovative practices both from an instructional side and a programmatic side for our students. You know, there's an awful lot to be proud of and to be excited about here in the school district of Reedsburg. We have amazing kids and we have talented, dedicated staff, many of whom have spent their entire career here in Reedsburg, committed to our kids. We try to keep class sizes low, particularly at the elementary level. We continue to strive to put innovative programs in front of our kids with an attempt to move all students towards higher levels of achievement. For example, last year we implemented a guided reading program with supplemental phonics at the elementary level. This year we impl implemented a comprehensive math program in grades K through 8. We continue at the high school level to do what we can to provide work-based learning opportunities for students. Our house flipping, cl house flipping class continues to be very successful. We try to put as many of our students into work-based learning opportunities through our youth apprenticeship program so that students during their school day have the chance to earn credit and work in a job that they're interested in in a potential future career or pay. This year, the school board approved a number of new classes at the high school, including an advanced placement computer programming class, Chinese 2, in a leadership class where our kids are going to be able to learn leadership skills that they will carry them through into the next stages of their lives. That class will culminate with a community-based project. You know, we do the arts pretty well here in Reedsburg as well. Last year, our musical performance of Cinderella earned a Best Musical in the State of Wisconsin Award from the Tommy Awards in the Overture Center in Madison, Wisconsin. This fall, our one-act play, One Stop Light Town, took home state awards. Last year, we had over 40 solo and ensemble acts advanced to state competition in the solo and ensemble program. And if you haven't gotten your ticket, March 10th, our Coralillos will be performing their home show again, and that's not something that you want to miss. We hold our own on the athletic courts and fields as well. Over the last 18 months, individuals and teams representing seven different sports advanced to state competition, with two of those individuals bringing home state championships to Reedsburg. And this past week, our wrestling team made it eight. In a couple of great matches, they advanced to the state team competition the first weekend in March down in Madison. Academics, the arts, and athletics, it's all here in Reedsburg, and we're just getting started. Shortly after the pandemic, began to wind down, the school board, and rightfully so, insisted that we re-engage with this community and that we put a plan going forward that strategically sets out goals and actions to move this district to new heights. For the last six months of last year, we did just that. The board, our leadership team, teachers, and representatives from parents and the community built a long-term plan that set the course for our future. We started with a new mission. Our mission is to empower students, all students, to maximize their potential in fearless pursuit of human excellence. When we say all students, we mean all students and that everyone in our buildings is all in to move all students. Our vision is an aggressive one. And we chose these words carefully and we don't take them lightly. 
Our desire is to be a world-class school district. We want our kids to be inspired, to inspire creativity, innovation, and a desire for greatness. It's what our kids and it's what this community deserves. We've set some pretty lofty goals and we're going to work hard over the next five years to achieve these goals. We'll report our progress towards these objectives three times a year to the school board. You'll have the opportunity in November, February, and May to hear our updates and to see how we're doing and how we're progressing towards these objectives. Are these pretty aggressive? Yes. Do we have a ways to go with some of them? Absolutely. But does our leadership team believe that we have the talent in our schools and the commitment from our teachers and our staff to move the needle towards these objectives on a regular basis? Absolutely. Now, how are we going to get there? We, had, we identified six strategic focus areas that will be the target of our work over the next five years. You'll see highlighted in yellow the one that we're here to talk about today, and that's innovative facilities with modern learning environments. Without question, we are focused on academic curriculum, rigorous programming, and career pathways for all kids. But to do that and do it well, we must be mindful of the facilities that we're putting our kids in. We don't believe hope is a strategy, so we can't simply ask that these six strategies, focus areas, get us through. So on an annual basis, we build tactical plans for each one of those focus areas. We have two tactical plans under the focus area of innovative facilities with modern learning environments. We're talking today about the first one, and that is developing a long-term facilities plan for consideration and board approval in June. We'll also be, be building, related to this work, a 10-year capital projects plan and with board approval implementing a capital projects fund by which we'll be able to start, start setting money aside for future capital maintenance needs. When we started strategic planning, I asked the board to consider that strategic planning did all the things that you see here, that it created a shared vision and direction for all stakeholders, that it establishes outcomes for which we all will accept responsibility. I believe that long-term facilities planning is strategic planning. And I think that you can put strategic, I'm sorry, that you can put long-term facilities planning in front of any of these start items and have it make sense. Long-term facilities planning is strategic planning. When we think about a long-term facilities plan, it really needs to answer three key questions. First, when should our deferred maintenance needs be addressed and how? You'll hear about that a little bit later in the presentation. How can our existing facilities best be adapted to meet the modern learning needs, the instructional approaches, and the programs that will support our kids and prepare them for careers, college, and life, and jobs, many of which have not yet been created? How can our existing facilities best be adapted to support future educational programming, to support new instructional approaches, and to support programs that will allow kids to be better prepared for college, careers, and life in jobs that have yet to be created? And finally, which of our aging buildings, if any, should be considered for replacement and when? All three of these things will encompass the long-term facilities plan. We can't do this work alone. And so we've engaged in partners on the architectural side, on the construction side, on the finance side, and around enrollment projections. I'm proud to say that we're working with Epstein Ewan Architects. They're a firm that has one whole arm of their organization that does nothing but school design. They maintain a large percentage of the school market in the state of Wisconsin, and they do outstanding work. We're also proud to partner with Kramer Brothers. They're not a new name here in Reedsburg. In fact, if you check, I believe their name is on nearly every dedication plaque in every one of our schools. They're a long-standing partner, and we're pleased to be working with them again. When we talk about the long-term facilities planning process, we are at the very top of this inverted pyramid. 
we are nowhere near talking about options or any potential projects. That's not what this work is about. It's about establishing a long-term roadmap that might envision a series of projects over 30 years' time. It's important, just like to having a strategic plan for academics, that we have a plan for our facilities. And that work begins today. You'll notice that in between each of the phases in this inverted pyramid is community engagement. Our board is committed to making sure that we're getting feedback from you. These are the community schools. And they're to the point now that we, they really can't move any further in this process until we share what they're thinking, until you share with us your feedback. You heard me say this is a long-term plan, and it is. The goal is to identify what this district will look like in terms of its facilities 30 years from now. That's in 2053. Those facilities will be serving children who aren't even born yet. Our goal is to be proactive, to be as fiscally responsible as possible, to maximize what we can do with taxpayer dollars, and to include far more than just bricks and mortar in our thinking, but to include how programmatic approaches, how instructional approaches impact design, how to best, and how best that we can use those to facilitate learning with our kids. In a nutshell, if I had to say what are the state of our facilities today, I would tell you this. We have some buildings that are aging and in need of repair. A lot of the systems in some of those buildings are beyond their useful lifespan. Just like your house, when you hit a certain age, you start replacing appliances, you start thinking about replacing that furnace, and you start thinking about putting a new roof on. The same is true in our schools. We have a school that was built in the 1950s, in the 1960s and in the 1970s. Think about what the state of those buildings 30 years from now. Our goal is to get out in front of that. Because they were built at a time when many programs didn't even exist, some of our facilities could be better at providing modern learning environments for our kids. And we'll talk about that a little bit. If we are truly committed to providing rigorous academic and career planning coursework to all of our kids, We've got a little work to do. And we're happy to be in a growing community. We have a city that's progressive, that is pro-growth. And with that comes new families, and with new families comes new kids. Let's start today by talking about our deferred maintenance. Last fall, we had our partners with Aramark, the company that we contract with for our custodial and maintenance work, complete a facilities assessment this was a comprehensive assessment of all of our buildings, all of the systems in our buildings. It was an assessment of any life safety features that needed updating. And they put together a report for us that detailed line by line the things that needed updating and the systems that were past their useful life for each building. It's not that we don't work hard to keep our buildings up. You can be very proud that we have a team that works very hard to maintain our buildings. But the reality of it is, we, we, like other school districts, struggle to prioritize funding. As the state restricts the amount of revenue that we can raise, Reedsburg, like districts across the state, have always prioritized those dollars into the classroom to keep class sizes down, to continue to provide curriculum materials for our kids. Sometimes that comes at the expense of capital maintenance. Over time, those trade-offs become larger and larger. And that's what we're seeing. It's really no different than your home budget. Sometimes you have to make a decision on whether you're going to try to extend that, the life of that furnace for a year or to take that trip over spring break. The district has done the same thing. You can be proud of what we've done, but we've, and we've had little choice to, but to defer maintenance projects. But that, those choices have left a growing list. You can see here the list of schools in the district when they were either built or when they were added on to in the total square footage. We currently maintain well over a half a million square feet of space in our schools. We asked our partners at Kramer Brothers to take 
the facility's assessment completed by Aramark and quantify the needs. And it looks like this. You'll notice that every school is broken down. There are three columns. The current estimated cost for updating the facilities. That cost adjusted for 5% inflation annually to November of 2024 and to, to, to 2026. The current total cost of deferred maintenance in all of our schools is just over $25 million. Adjusted for inflation out to 2026, that cost becomes $30 million. You'll notice in the pie chart how that's broken down. Well over half, or just over half, of the total cost is associated with Webb Middle School. With regard to key takeaways then, there are these. We know that facility maintenance can expand the useful lifespan of a building, but we know that systems within those buildings are going to require replacement from time to time to keep those buildings warm, safe, and dry. We know that that $25 million number will only go up over time. And we know that the board is going to be tasked with having to make some decisions about when it becomes a case of throwing good money after bad in light of aging facilities. It's also important to point out, though, that these dollars only provide a building that is warm, safe, and dry. These dollars do not include any cost of renovation. They do not any, any, include any cost for modernization. And they do not any, include any cost for remediation, particularly at Webb Middle School, which, as everyone knows, is seated right at the edge of a floodplain. Let's talk now about community growth and its impact on our own enrollment. We take for granted sometimes that we're living in a city that is so progressive. There are a lot of communities our size that want to stay just as the same size they are. They don't want to grow. But the reality is this. If you're not growing, you're shrinking. Our community leaders recognize that very well. And you can't hardly drive in any direction in Reedsburg and not see that recognition. Groundwork has begun on the new athletic facility. You should start seeing walls going up on the new Holiday Inn Express across from the golf course very soon. There are apartment complexes going up on multiple sides of town. We opened a splash pad last summer. The work on South School is nearly completed. And just across from the district office, a new four-unit strip mall is being developed. Personally, I'm hoping for one of them to be a sub shop. But with all of this growth in the community, comes growth with students. As a superintendent, it's much better to be working in a school district that's growing rather than shrinking. Better still to be working in a district that's growing incrementally and a bit slowly. That's us. Last year, we engaged with MD Roffers and Associates. Mark Roffer is an urban planner by training. And we asked him to take a look at the growth in their community and to provide enrollment estimates over time for our school district. Mark Roffers does not use just birth rates and survival rates from grade level to grade level to grade level when he makes those projections. He uses those data from the applied population lab in Madison, but he also takes into account community growth and new housing starts. He talks to developers, to builders, to city officials, and understands where homes are being started, where multifamily units are being started, where neighborhoods are turning over meaning that they're being sold to families, sometimes with young children. And he uses all of those data to project not only our enrollment, but where that enrollment is coming from. What he found was that we expect to grow by approximately 10 students a year over the next 10 to 15 years. He also found that the vast majority of that growth is going to occur within the city. If you take a look at the heat map on the side of your screen, You'll notice that the darker the color, the greater the concentration of enrollment growth. And what we're seeing in our school district is that most of the growth is occurring within the city and around the city edges. But we're also seeing that enrollment is declining in our rural areas in our district. That's a challenge, but it's also nothing different than what's occurring in rural communities across Wisconsin and across America. We have a school district that's over 240 square miles. 
but students in, are becoming increasingly concentrated in the city. This is something that the board needs to take into consideration as they consider, over time, how many schools would be best served in our district, at what grade levels, and what capacities sh should be best. We have to recognize that operating schools with too low of an enrollment do not gain any economies of scale. They're very expensive to operate, and more importantly, school districts with low enrollment are very difficult to provide equitable services to. In order to provide comprehensive services, it's important that we are able to staff broadly in those buildings. We can't do that if enrollment is too low. So part of the board's desire is to right-size our buildings over time. We took those enrollment estimates from Mark Roffers and we gave them to Epstein Ewan and we asked them to build building capacity charts for us. It, very simply, building capacity is determined by the number of classrooms in a building available for instruction multiplied by the number of the targeted number of students desired in each one of those grade levels. Epstein Ewan did that for us and they came up with these capacity levels that you see on your screen. Then they built a legend. You're going to see on the next slide some projections over time at every level in terms of our capacity. Anything that looks lavender indicates that capacity is significantly below what it could be. Anything in green is operating under capacity. Anything in yellow is like the sweet spot. It's, op it's operating just over or just under capacity. And when you see red, it's an indication that we're operating over capacity. Here's what that looks like over time in our schools based on the capacity study by Epstein Ewan and the growth projections from Mark Roffers. We expect to be approaching or beyond capacity in our K-2 buildings by 2030-31. The rest of our buildings, can, as they're currently aligned with grades, will operate at or under capacity, except the high school, which will continue to operate under capacity. Key takeaways in around enrollment and capacity, we are projected to grow slowly but steadily over the next 10 to 15 years. We'll begin to exceed capacity, but in no significant way, around 26, 27, and then we'll exceed capacity by the turn of the new decade at the elementary level. As we think about a 30-year plan, if we do nothing over 30 years, we will reach a point where our buildings are beyond capacity, except for the high school. Let's talk a little bit more about what modern learning environments look like and what they can do for schools. You know, it's been said that if Rip Van Winkle were to wake up today, one of the few things he might recognize in America is its school system. All other facets of our society have changed and grown and renovated in significant ways, much more quickly than our schools have. It's not that our schools haven't changed what, they ha what happens between those walls. They have. We continue to offer innovative programming. We continue to find new ways and new strategies to reach all kids. We continue to find innovative programs to prepare kids for the future. The challenge is that the school facilities have not kept pace nearly as quickly. Here's one quick example. We know employers more and more are wanting students who can come to them with collaboration skills. Students who can work as part of a problem-solving team to bring solutions to problems at work. They don't simply want kids who can regurgitate facts. Spaces can help facilitate collaboration. The picture at the top is Prairie Ridge. Just outside of the classrooms that can be observed through a full slate of curtain wall glass windows sits a collaboration area in every one of our pods. Kids can work with teachers, they can work in small groups, inflexible furniture that will allow for multiple options. The picture below is what collaborative work looks like at Webb Middle School. Students are sitting in the hall outside of classrooms. If they're lucky, they're sitting on old furniture pads from someone's deck. Much more challenging both to supervise and to effectively work together. Here's another example. One of our key strategies is to allow for or to prepare 
for rigorous programming and career options for all kids. Our goal is to start that work before students walk into the Reedsburg Area High School. And we'll start that with rigorous career exploration, matching what kids are interested in and their aptitudes with potential careers. And then beginning in middle school and moving into the high school, putting kids into opportunities to experience programs within those career pathways and within facilities that best facilitate those pathways. Finally, we hope that by the time our kids are juniors and seniors, as I said earlier, that part of their instructional day is spent at work in a work-based learning opportunity where kids can earn credit and they can gain valuable experience in areas that they're interested in. But the first time kids walk into a modern work environment should not be their first day on the job. And so we've got some work to do in modernizing our facilities to prepare students to work and in the kinds of spaces that they'll inherit. Now, Epstein Nguyen has put together a presentation around modern learning design. And we'll talk a little bit about how that came to be, about what modern design looks like and what themes are involved and why that's important. But to do that, we need to start at the beginning. In the Industrial Revolution, this is Henry Ford's assembly line, by the way, it was important that workers be able to be trained to do the same thing over and over and over again. It was highly repetitious, but it was highly effective. On the assembly line, people didn't have to think much. They had to be able to do. Where did people, um, where did workers from the assembly line come from in, during the Industrial Revolution? They came from schools. So it's no shock that the schools prepared kids for success on assembly lines. Kids were put into large classrooms, they sat in six rows of five desks, a teacher sat in front, gave them information to memorize, and they spit it back out. It meant it made for high degrees of success on the assembly line. This is an example of what a classroom might look like. Rows of desks with the teacher providing the direct instruction. This is a picture of Johnson Wax from the 1940s. Notice how while it's not an assembly line, there are rows and rows of workstations. And on the balcony above sat the supervisors making sure that the workers were doing what they were trained, how they were trained, and in what time. At this same time, schools continued to be built that frankly supported that kind of work. This building was built in the 1950s, but it still has large box classrooms on both sides of a hall. The hallways are only designed for traffic. There's nothing, there's no instructional use or opportunity provided by that other than space to move from class to class. In the 1960s, kids still sat in rows, largely provided with direct instruction from a teacher. Over time, however, employers found that they needed more. As we move well past the Industrial Revolution, it was important for employers to have kids come to them who could participate in higher levels of thinking. And so a shift was made towards higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy. It was important for kids to be able to be creative, to evaluate what they saw, to analyze and compare and contrast. Now, the vast majority of information that kids need can be found on their phone. It's more important they be, are able to discern the good from the bad information and to somehow communicate that information in a creative way. Around that same time, a guy named Howard Gardner said, you know, people have multiple intelligences. People learn in different ways. They have different learning styles, and those different learning styles can best be met with different learning environments. And the change was underway in the system of schools. It was a movement away from the sage on the stage to facilitating learning for kids. It was a move away from what one might consider cells and bells, large groups of classes, six rows of five desks with a teacher in the front, to a community of learners where kids learned in a facilitated way from the teacher, but also from each other. Education is not the only one to change. We've, we've just been changing a bit more slowly. Imagine walking into a hospital today and seeing the conditions that you see on the left side of your screen. It's very different today. 
The bottom picture on the right-hand side of your screen is a birthing room. I've got five kids, and I can promise you none of them were born in a room that looks like that. Beyond healthcare, our office environments are changing. They reflect the need to collaborate. They reflect the need to have small group spaces and open environments that people can learn from each other while they're working. Classrooms haven't kept pace. This largely reflects what classrooms look like in many of our schools and in schools across the country. Certainly some things have evolved. We've moved from a blackboard to a whiteboard to a smart board to an interactive TV in the front of the room. But we've not modernized the way other, other industries have. So what does that mean for schools? There are a number of design themes as we think about renovating spaces going forward that I'll ask us to consider. The first is flexibility. Notice in this classroom that there are operable doors between classrooms so that students can move freely into, into flexible groups so that a teacher can supervise a, a larger space in different groups for kids to meet their learning needs. Notice the furniture, most of it's on wheels, most of it's modular and can be set up in many different designs at any point at any given day. To put kids in large group and small groups can move, to move those tables around however it best meets the needs of our kids. The second theme is adaptability. Buildings last a long time, and so they should be able to be adaptable over that time. This is a building that one of the architects we work with designed very early on in his career. 25 years ago, it wasn't uncommon to use large load-bearing walls throughout the building. Structurally, that's very sound, but it's also very difficult to renovate and very expensive. It's difficult to move or even alter load-bearing walls. Now, in educational design is very different. It uses columns. Those columns support the ceiling, support the floors, but the rooms can be altered. The spaces within that can be altered. So over the course of 60, 70, 80 years in the lifespan of a building, they can be altered and adapted to meet potential changes in learning needs far more easily and far less expensive. The third theme is collaboration. You've heard it from me before, but the ability for students to work in pairs or in groups prepares them for the kinds of things that they're going to experience in life. Flexible spaces that allow for those different sizes of groups are very important. Here you see an example of a, of a, a tech ed classroom. The flexible furniture allows for large group instruction, but in that same space, there are places for individual and team workstations. Notice also one of our next themes, and that is visibility. You see glass from the hallway looking in to, to the tech ed spaces. We have so many innovative CTE programs that we're excited to continue to share, but many kids don't know about them because they haven't had a chance to see them, much less experience them. Our goal would be to, to provide a whole lot more transparency so that kids could see what's happening in some of these spaces. The fourth theme is choice. We talked about Howard Gardner and frames of mind and the different learning styles. That affects how kids learn. And spaces can positively impact that. Here's an example of a school that was renovated. No new square footage was added on. But it moved from a large set of boxy classrooms to a design that allowed for multiple functions and multiple sizes of spaces. For example, there are still large group spaces, places where an entire classroom could meet, but there are also think tanks, small group spaces where anywhere from five to 10 students could work on projects, could study together, or work in small groups. There's also space within the hallway for students to learn. It's being used for more than simply passing time. There are individual breakout spaces for kids and places for kids to sit and, lead, sit and read and learn quietly. The next theme is transparency. Transparency. Sometimes a lot of glass is equated with a lot of risk. We'll talk about security in, in a little while. But quite frankly, 
the best way for kids to maintain uh, positive order is to be supervised. And glass within the buildings allows for that. You'll notice here that these doors all are full of glass. And so when a student is working somewhere on a project or in a small group, a teacher can still very easily supervise those kids. Transparency in our building does one more thing, and that is it lets as much natural light in as possible. The next theme is security. Without question, that has become an increasingly con important concern for all of us, both of those who work in schools and for families who send their kids to us. Modern learning environments allow for security by creating multiple zones, multiple layers of security. All of our buildings here in Reedsburg currently have what we call secure main entrances. You don't even get into the main office without getting buzzed in and there's a camera that allows our office staff to see who wants access to the office. But you also don't get out of the office and into the main quarters of the hallway without going through a second locked door. Modern schools, however, also have additional layers of security. There's largely another door or access to the building and the space in the building where all of the kids are. You don't get through that door unless it's been unlocked for you. In this example, each of the learning pods provides yet another series of locked doors. Each of those series of doors can be closed and locked with a button in a main office. And then finally, the classroom doors can be closed. In a modern design such as the one you see here, there are five different layers of security. It isn't about the glass and the windows. It's about the measures of security and the layers of security that can be provided to restrict access in significant ways to kids and staff. And finally, social and emotional well-being is our last theme. We've heard more and more over the last several years about the mental health concerns for kids in our schools, and rightfully so. It's important that kids feel that schools are places that are designed for them. That our high school might have a place where kids can grab a cup of coffee before school. Right now, if you try to stop at a quick trip at 720 over by the high school, you're waiting in line. Why not put that in the building where our kids can feel that's something for them? It's important that modern learning spaces provide opportunities for kids to learn in flexible and comfortable ways. School shouldn't be a thing that kids have to do. It should be a thing they get to experience. Let me say that again. School shouldn't be a thing that kids have to do. It should be a thing that they get to experience. Why is that all important? In a broad survey, teachers indicated there's a strong connection to the instructional space and the learning environment overall. Largely, teachers felt while it was very important, and this wasn't a survey that was local, this was a broad survey. While they felt it was very important, very few gave their own classrooms an A for that kind of design. It's also important that because at least one study identified this as impacting achievement. I believe it's because the spaces, well designed, lend themselves well for the kinds of instructional practices that we know are more and more effective for kids. So what does this all mean? We've talked about deferred maintenance. We've talked about enrollment growth in our community and our school district. And we've talked about modern learning design and the potential impact that can have on kids. Where does that leave us and the school board in their current work? Well, they've taken everything that they've learned and they have identified some very broad strategies, very high level strategies for what they might think the school district should look like in the next 30 years. And we've asked them along the way to consider this 30 year plan like a road trip. If you were planning a road trip, what would you do? The first thing that you would do is decide on a destination. Where are you going? For the board, that means deciding what is the future destination of each of the spaces that we currently have. What will they look like over the next 30 years and what's needed to maintain them over that time? When you take a vacation, you have to decide what you're packing. And what you pack 
is largely determined by where you're going. If you're spending a week in the sunny Caribbean, you're taking one thing. If you're going skiing in Colorado, you're packing something else. The board hopefully is also packing things into the destination that they're putting together. That this just isn't about bricks and mortar. It's about being as fiscally responsible as possible. It's about knowing that the spaces that we need to create are designed to best meet the modern learning needs of our kids. It's about recognizing that career pathways for all kids are going to require some renovation in our spaces. We want form to follow function. We want to ensure that as we're doing this work, we're being mindful of what we're doing in our facilities to best facilitate the future learning needs of our kids here in Reedsburg. And as you take a trip, you have to decide what's your route look like? What stops do you want to take or need to take along the way? In our plan that the board will be putting together, we'll also have stops. We'll call them phases. What might be the first phase and what projects would be involved in the first phase of that work? And when does that occur? How does that relate to the lifespan of the systems in some of our buildings and the age of some of our buildings? All of these things will be considered as the board looks at what we currently have, and these are all the current buildings that we have and the current grade structures within each of those buildings, and what those look like 30 years down the road. The board has got some high-level brainstormed ideas, possible scenarios related to how many buildings might we have in the next, over the next 30 years. How, what grades will those buildings serve? And how large do those buildings need to be? Next month, we're going to ask you to give us your feedback. Take a look at what you see on the screen there. There's a QR code that you can use your phone to access. And if you don't want to do that, you can look at the, you can access the survey based on the website that you see below. We'll ask you to complete that survey by the 22nd of February. When you've completed the survey, it will immediately take you to a sign-up sheet. And we're inviting you to focus group sessions on the 21st of March or the 29th of March. There'll be repeated sessions, and so you only need to attend one. At those sessions, we'll spend a very small amount of time sharing with you a number of scenarios that the board is considering. But the board right now can't do anything else until they hear from the community. It's important to get your feedback. Your feedback about the number of schools that would best serve our kids over time. Your feedback on potential grade alignment in those buildings and the programs that should be inside of them. We'll spend the next time we gather listening to you. These are your schools. The board recognizes that. They're committed to community engagement and they want to hear from you. Please take a moment to complete this short survey and sign up for a focus group. Thank you for your commitment to our kids. Thank you for your commitment to our community and for your time today. I hope that you found it helpful. If you have any questions, please feel free to give me a call or to send me an email. And we look forward to your engagement next month and into the future as we try to prepare all kids for success in the future. Thanks, everybody.